look like? Well, I would resign the job. What would you do, Charlie? <laughs> no, it's an impossible problem because, first of all, you have to decide whether what GAAP is supposed to reflect, and it doesn't reflect value. But in certain cases, of course, it is important to say that this is value and so on. I mean, it is a, it's, it's, it's a convention, and it is done so that the auditor generally is protected because otherwise everybody sues everybody in this country for anything. And it's designed to uh, uh, cause people who want to report a given amount of whatever is desired by the market to largely be able to do it. I, and I, I don't know how I would write the rules. I mean, I've watched people who I would be delighted to have live next to me. You know, if I was going away for two weeks and my kids were to stay at somebody's house, it'd be fine with me if they, they stayed there. If I lost my wallet someplace and they found it, they'd, they'd return it to me. But they'd play, it, they'd play games with any number that came to them. And of course, it, it, it's a very awkward thing to be on the audit committee of a company where people are playing around with the numbers. And, and, and they don't want you. If you raise a stink, you've got all kinds of problems. And I actually wrote something some years ago of four, I was kind of anticipating your question about 15 years ago, I guess, and I, uh, I wrote four suggestions for questions to be asked of the audit committee. And uh, I don't know whether I was on the audit committee then of Coke or whatever, but anyway, I mean, it was just clear to me what was, what was happening. But you had to, you really had to follow the charade or you got in all kinds of trouble for doing that too. And so uh, I just, put four questions out that, that I would want to know. And they were perfectly logical questions. And, and in the end, nobody adopted them. I mean, it, 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 the system was fine as it was. The auditors got sued, but not that often. And, and uh, the SEC had lots of rules, and I admired the SEC enormously. I think, I think the country is better off because of the SEC, but, but it is a hopeless question, it's a, a question to, or problem to uh, devise rules that, that people can't get around. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not, I think it was, who was it that uh, uh, my friend that was a writer said, it's not the illegal things that are outrageous, it's the legal things. <laughs> uh, it, it's just, it's very hard. You try and it's worthwhile and you need an SEC but the SEC can't really stop the stuff that, that you know, you would find outrageous. It, you know, it, uh, it explains, and the auditors have the same, the same question. I mean, the auditors really want to, they want rules and they want processes and they want it to be so they can operate. Charlie found a, he was on the audit committee of Solomon and, we had probably literally millions of contracts where people put numbers in. And, uh, and he found that $20 million, we had the largest auditing firm in the country then, Arthur Anderson, as I remember. Charlie. They're gone now. Yeah, they're gone now, but they, were the, <laughs> but they were the largest. And Charlie found a $20 million error, I think, one time at an audit. They called it a plug. When your accountant starts talking about a plug, it's not good. Well, I'll tell you a story I haven't told before. <laughs> you saw in that movie, people who are here saw me testify in August before a subcommittee who were out to you know, get their way. And, and, uh, uh, and I... I just decided, you know, I was just going to answer every question honestly, and I was not going to try and draw up anything. And so I just sat in front of them and, and, uh, and said what I knew and didn't know. And one of the things I said, which was absolutely true, is that I'd only been there 
10 days or so at Solomon, but I said, I really haven't seen anything yet that strikes me as terrible and accounting. Uh, but I've been there 10 days, but, uh, but, but this guy who got us in all this trouble so far, he's the only thing I found. I don't know what else is gonna be found. How in the hell could I know what had gone in a place that was doing you know, incredible numbers of transactions and everything. Well, uh, but I said, you know, what I've seen, the accounting strikes me as, as legit. Uh, about a month later, I was so happy I testified earlier, not later, uh, a very fine CFO, and very, these are decent people, they're very decent people, and he comes in and he said, uh, Warren, there's, there's probably something you should know. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, 12 years earlier, or whatever it was, Solomon had merged with Fibro, which was a huge trading company. Solomon was a huge investment banking company. It became his huge powerhouse. And he said, uh, 12 years ago when we merged with him, uh, we sort of couldn't find exactly, they were on a trade basis and we were on a settlement basis. And, and they said, we, we never really figured out how to put the books together. This is the largest uh, audit company in the United States, Arthur Anderson, that's responsible for signing this thing. So we have this number and every day it moves around and it's just put in there to make assets equal liabilities. <laughs> and, and, you know, today it's 173,412,000, you know, <laughs> down to a penny and tomorrow it'll be something different. You know, and I thought to myself, I am sure glad I testified for Congress a month ago because I did not know then. But uh, if they ever ask, ask me again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell them exactly what happened. That, that we just got this number that floats around every, every day and we haven't found it in 12 years and Arthur Anderson doesn't know where it is. <laughs> and, and, you know, you gotta make the assets equal the liabilities, right? I mean, so what else do you do? <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. And strange things happen in this world. There's one I thing I- think the name was the floating plug. Yeah, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Charlie's on the audit committee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the one thing I've always suggested, nobody ever wants to do this, yeah, I can understand why. But you've got trillions of dollars worth of contracts and everything that people are putting down little numbers for every day at banks and investment banks and all over the world. I mean, commodity traders. And, and at Berkshire, we, we stick down something. You know, there's certain hedging that even the, the regulators want us to do in terms of giving utilities, and we put a little number in. And... I've, I've made the suggestion once or twice that if you really want to do something sort of interesting, you know, just get some young guy, that give him a couple of weeks and pick the 100 most kind of complicated, long-term, you know, lots of wording, uh, derivative contract, and look at what one side who promises to do something, values it at, and look at what the other side, who also reports, you know, and, and just let them do it for 100 operations at random. I just like to know if somebody's valuing some, we're valuing a contract at 28 million, the other guy's valuing it at 33 million, to, you know, and, and you've got the same auditing firm on, in both cases, and they're, they're, they're signing their name to them. Nobody ever. I don't think anybody's ever done anything with that suggestion. <laughs> and it, it's, you know, that would be the first thing I would do, actually, if I really wanted to sort of dig into what was happening in accounting. But, but there's a lot of things in life you can't change. And, and uh, nobody is going to go looking for ways to create lawsuits and newspaper stories, <laughs> all kinds of things, and I don't blame them. But, uh, I did, I said, I brought one thing. I just couldn't resist. I was hoping I'd get a question, so I'll ask it myself. Uh, <laughs> I was hoping to get a question that, how could be some guy be so idiotic as to propose a price that 
of $848.02 or whatever it was, or is, for Allegheny Court. And, I mean, that, isn't that getting a little scientific? You know? <laughs> and, and of course, I did provide, when I made the offer, that it'd be $850 less whatever was paid to whatever investment banker they wanted to select Allegheny in this case. And, and they're bound to have to do it because Delaware law is developed in such a way that the directors are protected if they get expert opinions, all that sort of thing. So I, I, don't, I don't fault anybody in the system, but I just thought it might be useful, actually, uh, maybe to Delaware judges someday, Delaware, Delaware statute makers, maybe people that are writing papers, who knows? But I suggested that, that we just, since I'm willing to pay $850, a share for the place as is, you know, if the audit fees are, I mean, if the, if the advisory fees are 10 million or 40 million, then it makes a difference to someone. And, and, uh, and it's always made a difference to us as the buyer, but that's just the way the game was. Well, there's a little history to that. And I went back and there's been twice in the, nobody's ever paid attention to this, but, but it, uh, there's been twice in the history of Berkshire Hathaway, 57 years, twice that Berkshire was required to get a fairness opinion. And it was perfectly logical that we be required to get a fairness opinion in those two cases, because in one case, diversified retailing, which was a company I was invested in, in both of them that came out of our partnership. But one had a group of shareholders that were different than the other group of shareholders at Berkshire, and the two of them want to merge. So you have two companies with me being the biggest beneficiary in between. And, uh, and it really, it wasn't up to me to determine the ratio. I mean, even though I had the most involved, but, but I had a little more of one company than the other. So anyway, a fairness and opinion was required. And this has only been twice in the history of Berkshire that one was required. So naturally I went to Charlie. And I said, Charlie, you know, we do have to, I mean, Charlie told me, we, he knew it better than I did. We need a fairness opinion in this case. And uh, I said, you know, I know what's fair. You know what's fair. Sandy knows what he thinks is fair. If the three of us owned it, in 10 minutes, we could have worked out a deal that all three of us regarded as fair. But because there were public shareholders and everything, it wasn't right to do it that way. And, and the, first time, the first one, we have two of these, but the first one was uh, November 27th, 1978. And I told the shareholders, essentially, that... Uh, my personal belief is that both diversified and Berkshire shareholders will benefit from the merger, but I will not. I will, I will vote for the merger only if a majority of the shares, which are voted by other shareholders of each company, are voted to support it. So, I, I, which was fine. I committed myself, you know, that that let the other people decide whether this is fair. But on top of that, we needed to get a fairness opinion from an investment bank with a big name and everything. And so I said to Charlie, I said, you know, these things are going for a million or two million bucks where they get some guy that they hired last week and he, he writes up a little thing and, and then we get a bill for a million or two million. They really haven't done anything. They don't, they don't know either company and you know, they, there's a million things they're not gonna know about it, but, but they're gonna write an opinion. And, uh, and we need the opinion. I said, so what do I do? I go to Charlie with these kind of problems. And Charlie said, Warren, it's very simple. He said, uh, uh, pick out 10 prestigious investment banks and do exactly what I say. <laughs> so, okay, Charlie, uh, what do I do? When I call and get these 10. He says, well, put them in order, one through 10. And he said, call the guy at the top of the list 
and tell them you'll pay them $60,000 for doing a fairness opinion. And you know that it's an insulting price and it's ridiculous for him to do it because it'll affect what he can get from other people down the line. They'll look back and they'll say, well, Buffett only paid 60000 Why should I pay $2 million? And it's, 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 but he says, just tell them that that's what you'll pay. And if, if they're insulted by it, which they probably should be, then that you'll go to number two. And they'll offer them the same deal. And you'll just keep going down until you get to number 10. And if you don't have anybody by number 10, you've told the other people, you'll come back to number one again. And you'll say, well, I'll pay 80000 And then you'll go down the list and everything. Well, so I picked 10 names out. And number one name was Jack Shad. And Jack Shad was a, a, a friend of Tom Murphy's, a friend of Bill Ruane's, and he was running E.F. Hutton, and he was, he, he was a very, very, very successful investment banker. I didn't know him as well as the others, but I'd, I'd met him through my friends. So I called up and I said, Jack. I said, I've got this crazy request. He says, only because everybody admires you so much, and my friends are your friends, and blah, 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 and E.F. Hutton is so well regarded. I said, I'm going to do something that's, I'm going to ask you something that is totally against your interest, and I fully understand the fact that you're gonna say, you're an idiot to call me on this and slam down the phone. Yeah. But I said, Jack, here's, a, here's our procedure, and I described this procedure that he gets called first, and if he turns it down, then I go to Payne Weber, and then I go to the, and then I go through it. And I tell them, there's these 10 people, and if we don't get any yeses, I'm gonna come back to you again, and, I'll offer you 75, and we'll do the same thing till somebody says yes. Uh, and I said, Jack, you know, but you are the first call. So uh, $60,000, and it's going to screw up your business if you do this, because every client you get in the future is going to say, well, you did it for diversified retailing in Berkshire, and why in the world should we pay you $2 million when he paid you 60000 And Jack said, don't worry about it, Warren. <laughs> I can take care of that. <laughs> he says, we're in. And uh, <laughs> so we got a fairness opinion but, but, uh, but for one side. And now the next call I made was to Payne Weber, and I said, gave him the same story. And uh, uh, I said, E.F. Hutton was dumb enough to take the one side for 60000 bucks. You know, I, I don't know why the hell they're doing it. You know, they're, they're destroying their reputation and all that. And Payne Weber said, We'll take the other side for 60000 <laughs> <clears throat> So we have, a pers we have a thing here that describes the whole process. And they got well, though. They sent out an amiable alcoholic they well, had to do something with. Well, what they did <laughs> was they each billed us for 60000 bucks, <laughs> and we paid it. That's what you get for 60000 bucks. No, no, no. <laughs> we... We got the same thing everybody else got, yeah, Charlie. Know, uh, and, 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 of course, Jack Shad, uh, this was 1978, he was appointed chairman of the FCC for <laughs> seven years. I mean, I mean Jack, Jack liked to do business. And, and it's true, it didn't hurt him. They paid us 60000 and they went back and charged somebody else $2 million, you know, the next week. And those guys, it's all play money. And... Uh, so we did the same thing when we got the blue chip stamps, where we were similarly conflicted four or five years later. We went back to the same two guys, and there had been a lot of inflation and everything like that. So we, we said 110000 then. I've got the prospectus for that. And both of them said, you know, send it in. Don't worry about our other clients. We can, we can, we'll figure out some story to tell them, you know, and whatever it may be. But I just thought it would be interesting at some point, have people realize that it's not play money. Somebody pays it, and it's a game. And you know, it, it, it uh, but it's 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 what passes muster in Delaware, and the directors will have it explained to them by the lawyers that they're not going to get sued if they do it in a certain kind of way. And you know, it, it it's a. Uh, uh, so I just decided that somebody at some point ought to point out what actually is happening in this situation. 
And that's why we did it that way. And, and uh, you know, it, it may go down with our earlier attempts to educate the world on the realities of finance and its various interactions and why it's better to teach your son to be an investment banker than to be an electrician, you know, or something. But uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, you've got an eccentric chairman and that's what he did. <laughs> Charlie, how do you feel about this whole matter? <laughs> it was your idea, um, originally. <laughs> well, it's, we're a little peculiar. <laughs> and it's not all, all the peculiarities are not bad. I talked to Charlie before. And I didn't talk to Charlie before I did it this, uh, this time. But, yeah. It, but, Charlie has given me four ideas and together that on extremely practical matters <laughs> with so much, uh, I mean, it, they, 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 they just changed everything. I, I think you really ought to tell them about the experience with the fraud claim, Charlie. <laughs> uh, what? On the fraud claim, it, uh, you know, that, uh, the fidelity claim with the guy, you know, you had, you had the, very well-known insurance company that you don't have to name names, but uh, where that, you know, you basically told them just raise the stakes uh, to, to make the, the game fair. This was back in the 1960s. Do you remember that? I don't remember. Oh, well, I, I do re I remember. Well, tell it then. Uh, <laughs> um, Charlie had this tiny little operation which he ran as fund also had a seat on the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange. The firm was called Wheeler Munger. It was called Wheeler Munger at first, later it changed itself to Munger Wheeler, and Jack Wheeler said, well, pretty soon it'll be Munger and Company, but that's okay. They, Jack Wheeler was a very interesting guy, and he had the specialist position in General Motors and a few things. And some employee stole like, I don't know, 12,000 bucks or something like that from yeah, the well, he had, he had, I remember, he had the trading tickets. Yeah. yeah. Some guy, some guy steals some money. And Charlie's firm, Wheeler Marker, was required to have a fidelity bond and all these things that covered dishonest employees and all of that sort. So this guy's clearly dishonest. He's clearly stolen the money. So Charlie puts in a claim for $12,000 or something like that, whatever the loss was, and sends it to this very big and prestigious insurance company. And of course, the insurance company denies this claim. They say, you know, the guy really wasn't employed, he doesn't exist, you don't have a dog, you know. I mean, the, the whole thing. And Charlie gets this letter back and they're not gonna pay the claim. And uh, so Charlie writes a letter to this very well-known, big name, uh, person that runs the insurance company. And he said, look it, he said, we have this $12,000 claim. And he said, this guy stole the money. Uh, and we thought we had an insurance policy against people stealing, <laughs> paid us, people stole money. And he said, he said, we're in this very interesting position because you've got a bunch of people on the payroll and they're gonna get their weekly check or monthly check, whatever they do. So they just say, we're not gonna pay. And life goes on. Whereas I'm sitting here and I've got my time. I got to work on this thing. And it isn't worth the $12,000 for me to fool around with this claim against the company and they'll appeal it and all these things. So he said, I know that you would be offended by the thought that you might be using this inequality a bargaining position to avoid playing at the claim. I, that never could be your intention. So what I suggest in order to really live up to your code of behavior is why don't we make the $12,000 claim, we'll just, we'll just multiply it by 10 and call it 120,000 either way. And if you lose, you pay me 120,000. If I lose, I'll pay you 120,000. Now it's worth my while. And, uh, <laughs> He addresses the letter to the chairman and says, that's the guy. He gets a 
$12,000 check by return mail. <laughs> it's not a bad lesson. He's told me two others, but the tricks are too good. <laughs> I don't even want to share them now. I may use them myself someday. Have you 